it away. All right, well, we're going to get started. Welcome today on a Friday. Thank you all for coming. Um, sorry we get started a little bit late. As you guys know, Inviso is in here, so we just had to switch, switch gears, so I appreciate your patience. Um, we are honored today to be here with Jennifer Marshall. Um, she came all the way from D.C., got out of the snow, thankfully, which has been crazy, as you guys all know, in D.C. Um, she is the Director of Domestic Policy Studies at the Heritage Foundation, as well as the Director of the Center for Religion and Civil Society, and the author, we're going to touch on this a bit, the author of a book published in 2007, Now and Not Yet, Making Sense of Single Life in the 21st Century. And I promise, guys, this will be interesting for you as well, but it'll be especially interesting for the girls, probably. Um, so as is usual, we're going to start kind of back at the beginning. Um, you grew up in Wheaton, Illinois, mm -hmm. correct? That's did right. You have, what did your parents do? Did you have siblings? Just kind of talk us through that a bit. Yeah, I'm the oldest of four, and my dad's a medical doctor. My mom trained as a nurse, but then was at home while we were uh -huh. um, children. And she's now at, working at the Wheaton College bookstore. I'm a proud alumna of Wheaton College, and I have a younger brother who also went to Wheaton. Um, so we believe strongly in Christian education, grew up in the Christian schools there in Wheaton, and went to a, a high school called Wheaton Academy, which goes all the way back to 1853. Okay. Pretty. And you had an interesting adventure from ages of five to seven. Yeah. Tell us a little bit about that. So um, my dad, after finishing med school, decided that he wanted to go overseas and um, practice uh, medical missionary work for a while. And we went to Taiwan in 1977 when I was five years old. We had three of three. Uh, my parents had three kids at the time. We all got around on a motorcycle. I sat on the gas tank, and then it was my dad, and then the middle uh, child, and then my mom, and then the littlest one in a backpack on the back. So we had great, you know, memories like that, and just, just a lot of fun to be in. Um, we were talking about some of our missionary heritage exchanges. It was really a, a wonderful cross-cultural experience that shaped my life more than I knew at, at that age. Hmm. Another thing, and this is probably a small part of your childhood, but it's close to my heart. You spent time in Kansas yes. as a child, right? During the summers, a third generation farm yeah. in Kansas? Yep. We um, actually, <coughs> excuse me, I was born in Kansas oh, City, Kansas. Okay. Like, not many people can claim that, I don't think. Yeah. <laughs> Kansas City, Kansas, and my dad grew up on a farm outside of Dodge City, Kansas. Okay. Um, we would every summer go out there for his vacation. We did wheat harvest, and this was wonderful as a kid, just to have a week or two where you were huh. swimming and the grain bins turned upside down and all these wonderful experiences that you yeah. don't have in suburban Illinois. Yeah. Well, Kansas is a great place. Yes, so. <laughs> absolutely. Good. So Wheaton for college. Yeah. You studied French. Mm -hmm. I was planning to be a teacher, a French teacher. Okay. And I got lost in Washington. <laughs> so how did you transition from Wheaton, a French major, to Washington, D.C.? How did, how did that So happen? here's how that part of the story goes. I, um, of course, as a French major, you have to actually spend some time in France and studying French language over there from native speakers. And I did my study at the Sorbonne in uh, one summer between my junior and senior years of college. And then I went on to student teaching at the Black Forest Academy in Germany. Some of you may know that or even have graduated from it. Um, and that five month period really gave me a new exposure to what's going on in Europe. And I came back thinking um, there is something distinctly different about European culture and it's concerning, um, the, the postmodern aspects of it. The, um, there was not as much vigorous debate about some really important worldview issues, I thought. So I came back to the United States thinking, who's doing anything about that here in America? Because I can see us being on something of a slippery slope towards that, where we don't have that um, vigorous public debate about some of the most important issues of our day. And I didn't know anything about public policy at the time, sorry to say, as a senior in college. I hadn't been exposed to that. I hope you guys are getting a good exposure to that here. So I went into the library and just looked up the words that I thought might lead me to it. And the book that I remember to this day, having checked out a whole stack, the book that I remember was The Devaluing of America by William J. Bennett. And that just really resonated with me. His articulation and diagnosis of some of the 
um, things that were going wrong culturally in America and what we might do to restore them. That kind of captured my imagination and I started finding out about who was doing that kind of work in Washington, D.C. And I hit on the, the Family Research Council right. and their Washington internship, which I did right after college okay. in 1994. And then that led to a full-time position. That's right, position. in education policy. Okay, and you ended up there as the Senior Director of Family Studies, That's is right. that right? That's okay. right, so kind of spread out from the education work, which I had trained in, right. to more of a general um, family perspective, which I think, just as a side note, I think yeah. it's really critical that we handle issues like education in the context of the family and mm -hmm. the culture. Mm -hmm. You can't segregate these things, and to artificially set them apart, I mean, you're never gonna really get at solving the issues surrounding the, some deep-seated issues of of how um, we develop as human beings. Huh. Yeah. Well, before we move forward, just to back up a bit, when you were at Wheaton, if you would have been told that this is where you were today, would that have surprised you? I mean, where did you think you would be if you looked back at your years, you know, four years in college? Yeah. Where did you think you would be at this point in your life? It totally would have surprised me. Yeah. I thought I would be a mother with. Um, Five kids, really, <laughs> driving a minivan, teaching so, on the side, teaching on the side, or even yeah. teaching them at home. Yeah. I, that's what I pictured, and I, yeah. I really did not have a concept at all of having a career. Yeah. So and we'll probably get into that a bit more when we yeah. talk about the book. But so you're at the Family Research Council for six years, mm -hmm. I think maybe it was, and then moved to France. The pull of France came yeah. again. Yes, I. Um, uh, truthfully, I actually was a little bit burned out of Washington, and that's, um, I think, a key lesson for mm -hmm. the 20s. As you get out of college and go on to your next step in life, you have the choice to ha as to how you're going to balance your life. And it's really important during that time to make choices that are sustainable, a sustainable life pace. And um, for a variety of reasons, I, I just felt like that I, I was really burned out on Washington. It can do that to people pretty yeah. quickly. And, I went to teach at a classical Christian school in Lyon, France, and totally enjoyed it. We were the, the classical um, curriculum that many of you may be familiar with is just really rich, yeah. and and it was fun to teach in that environment. I had Norwegian students and Australian yeah. students and Korean, and you can imagine what that's like as a as a student body. It's yeah. just really fun. And what did you teach in particular? I taught humanities, and okay. so the classical curriculum goes, you know, kind of goes chronologically. And I was teaching 1500 to 1900, which, what fun is that? You know, all those fun topics years, between yeah. that, that time. So we, we combined history and literature, and that's what I was teaching. Okay. And then what pulled you back to D.C. after being there? You were just there for a year, Just there right? for a year. Yeah. So I helped build the curriculum for the upper school and then came back. And I was... Um, I guess I really got convinced that public policy was my vocational mm -hmm. calling mm -hmm. and I needed to be back in that. a little time away. Yeah, to, to be able to have yeah. some perspective on that yeah. and to see this is deeply in me, um, this is where I can exercise my gifts. I have a longing to be a part of the debates that are happening in public policy mm -hmm. and, and mm -hmm. so I came back and um, back to mm -hmm. Washington. Great. So you went back first to Empower America. Yeah. And just give us a little overview. What what was your work yeah. there? Yeah. So I went. I actually spent a little more time at the Family Research Council, and then oh, went okay. to work at Empower America. And that was great fun because that was Bill Bennett was my boss there, and oh, okay. um, he was the guy that got me into this in the first place yeah. with that great book, Devaluing of America. So it was kind of fun to have that come full circle and get yeah, to know him a little better. Um, it was. Uh, I, I think one of the really um, important things that I would point out. Uh, that I learned from him is just the di it's important to diagnose what's wrong with our current situation, but it's mm -hmm. also important to point the way towards how we restore it mm -hmm. and how um, call people to a better vision for what our society can be and what America for America to live up to its ideals. Yeah. And that was just really exciting to learn how to do that from um, somebody who is just thoroughly imbued with um, great books and great thoughts and a great intellectual life and, and that. I learned a lot from that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and then that led you to Heritage in 2003. Yes, yes that's right. Um, where you were the Director of Domestic Policy Studies, as I mentioned. And then you also, is, it, in conjunction with that, work at the Center for Religion and Civil Society. Is that yeah. within? It is. That's okay. right. Yeah, the okay. DeVos Center for Religion and Civil Society is a part of the Heritage okay. Foundation. Mm -hmm. Great. And just as an, uh, you know, 
an overview, you oversee research in areas, this is from the website, that determine the character of our culture, education, marriage, family, religion, and civil society. That's right. Just to start off with a basic question, how do you keep up with all of that? <laughs> I mean, things happen every day in those areas, especially in Washington, D.C. What's your system for keeping your tabs mm -hmm. on the big legislature, you know, legislation coming across the table mm -hmm. and topics across the country? What, how do you manage all of that? Yeah. Well, thankfully, I have a great team, and yeah. they're the real subject matter experts in a variety of these things. Yeah. Um, folks like Robert Rector, who was yep. um, very much behind the 1996 welfare reform, part of, uh, part of the architecture of that. Um, people like Chuck Donovan, who's a veteran yeah. of the D.C. world, and Ryan Messmore and some other scholars. So I um, really have the joy of helping their work go further mm -hmm. and uh, planning the strategy that goes with that being able to put it all together and make sure that we're making the most of every opportunity yeah. to present these arguments. And um, like you read there, I think it's just so critical that we display that the character of our culture, mm -hmm. our families, our communities, and so on, are really intimately tied to our economic stability, mm -hmm. our ability to lead in the world. And these are not, you can't separate these questions. They all come together, and that's how we proceed in our work mm -hmm. on these things. So. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, it's a deluge of information. There's always a new study to read, but um, that keeps it interesting and yeah. fun and I have a great well, team to work with. And I'm sure you're called upon a lot to touch, touch on certain subjects with news media. And, yeah. I mean, do you prep a lot getting ready for topics on certain areas? Do you, um, how, how do you um, every day kind of walk into the office and say, I'm supposed to present you know, this perspective on a certain, mm -hmm. on a certain topic? Well, then, I guess what I would say is the the best part about it is yeah. we know that the fundamentals don't change. Yeah. So we know what those things are. Um, we know uh, that there is some basic evidence about the, the importance of the family, the importance of community, the way that religious faith contributes to the common good. Um, so it's, it's wonderful to be able to walk into an mm -hmm. environment with those convictions. And then, um, you know, what the, the tools that we have to be able to communicate about that. Yeah. That includes empirical work, that includes um, rhetorical creativity, that includes networking and coalition building, relationship building, essentially. Those are just tools to be explored and yeah. used to, to advance yeah. um, these first principles, really. Yeah. One of the tools <clears throat> I noticed, and I think our students could be interested in this, familyfacts.org, right? Yeah. Uh, an amazing website. I just looked at it for a few minutes, but has all sorts of studies and statistics just about particularly these issues that are resources for yeah. people. Yeah. Thank you for mentioning that. Yeah. Familyfacts.org is our site. It has about 3,500 findings from like peer-reviewed journals and research studies about the significance of the family, the significance of religious individuals and institutions in society. And that's one aspect. We really try to present the empirical evidence about what we know about um, the, these basic institutions of society. So, mm -hmm. and, and house it there to make it easier for everybody, yeah. including ourselves, yeah, <laughs> you know, to be able to find fast facts about these important things. Yeah. Well, just as a quick overview, what are one to two issues that you think we'll continue to hear a lot about um, in this next year, and particularly relating to the subjects that you, you know, work with every day? Yeah. I think we're going to be hearing a lot about education and the role of the federal government in education. Mm -hmm. um, we're certainly going to see some uh, more, we're gonna see a lot more spending in that. And part of our chagrin is that we have for decades seen that the more you spend, it does not correlate with improved educational opportunity. What does improve children's um, educational experience is the ability for their parents to choose their schools. Mm -hmm. And that we're fighting really hard right now for a very small program in the uh, nation's capital, the DC Opportunity Scholarship Program. And just to go on this for a minute, yeah. if I might, the, the, you, yeah, our nation's capital is home to some of the worst public schools in America. We're spending something like $14,000 per student there. One out of eight students has been threatened with a weapon. Um, they come in almost dead last in test scores. These are it's unbelievable that we are having such a bad experience with education in what should be you know, a, an example for the nation. So about five years ago, there was finally um, 
legislation passed that would allow students to go to a private school of their parents' choice. So a safe and effective school where they could hope to learn. And it's been just incredible. Huh. We've seen um, young, young people transfer out of these failing schools and become valedictorian of uh, one of the Catholic high schools in town. And um, you'll just see experience after experience like that where it has totally transformed the lives of these kids. Mm -hmm. And it's so exciting to see those kids. We, and we do everything we can. In fact, we've just produced a video that you might be interested in called Let Me Rise. Um, and, and it tells the story of these kids because you cannot hear their stories without being affected and say, how can we be pursuing failed educational strategies when this is giving them hope. These kind of educational options are giving them hope. So that's one big fight that's on right now. Yeah, absolutely. And then I think, too, we're going to have a lot more debate in a variety of issues about how we meet human need. And it's, it's clearly tough times in our economy, and that puts the people who are most at risk in greater peril. And so what are we going to do about that? How are we going to meet those needs? Well, we've been thinking a lot about that. And you can stop me if you want to talk yeah, about this yeah, later. Yeah, but yeah, we've free. been really talking about that a lot in this new product we yeah, have please. called Seek Social Justice. And this is a workbook that's available at seeksocialjustice.com. But the, um, basically what we've been trying to do here is to talk about what's the real diagnosis of poverty and human need in America. And when you get really right down to it, Material aspects are usually symptoms of something deeper, and that deeper thing is relational breakdown, often the absence of fathers, the breakdown of community. And so we start by diagnosing that and then talking about if that's the real nature of the problem, well, then what should we be doing to solve it? Well, we need family engaged. We need churches engaged. We need work opportunities. We need government playing its proper role. We need individual responsibility. And so this is a six-week small group study that helps you explore that. And we did this. Yeah. Um, it's much different than the usual white paper that we do at Heritage. But we yeah. did it because this is so critically important as uh, a paradigm for looking at all these discussions. Watch the nightly news tonight. You're going to see something about people in need. And mm -hmm. you know, think about the worldview being presented there. Often, it's that if we only spent more money, if we only had another program, if we only did more from Washington, and the saddest thing about that is it has a history of not making it any better. It has a history of actually sometimes exacerbating the problem. And we think that's terribly tragic for the people involved. So to better recognize human dignity, to better help them uh, rise above their current circumstances, we want to see this relational approach. It's why we've produced Seek Social Justice. We, we think it's great for a college audience, and we really encourage yeah, yeah. groups to use it to, to really break through this paradigm that's out there. Well, and it's such a hot topic now. I mean, you can't you know, have a conversation without someone talking about social justice. So it's exciting that you guys are producing material that relates to it, but in a way with you know, maybe a different perspective than yeah. other other people may be using the term social justice. Exactly. To, and what it often means is redistribution. Yeah. That's what we've, you know, we've come across is that it means moving money around from the wealthy to the poor. And yeah. it's a much deeper issue than that. And we want to make that, that conversation more edifying. Yeah, yeah. Well, um, we'll talk about the book in just a minute. But one thing you did right beforehand and then some as I understand it sometimes while you're writing the book, is get a master's yes. from the Institute for World Politics. Yeah. Why did you choose this particular place to get a master's? Mm -hmm. And tell us a little bit about the um, Institute for World Politics. Yes, I, I am a great enthusiast for I think the... our students will find it interesting. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I would love for you to consider the Institute of World Politics, iwp.edu. Um, it's a great place to get a master's degree. I came out of college with a French and education degree. And I kept thinking, maybe I'll go back to get um, a master's degree, but I couldn't figure out in what. So it took me almost 10 years to figure out that what. And I was interested in the cultural issues that I was dealing in at the time in my work in Washington, but being able to talk about those and converse about them on an international scope. Mm -hmm. And the Institute for World Politics is a great place to be able to engage those questions. They integrate the study of foreign policy and international relations with economics and with cultural issues, which I find, I just think that's so true to human nature, to the way society works. And it's a terrific way, if you are at all interested in international topics, I highly recommend 
checking out IWP.edu. Yeah. They're really terrific. And your master's is in statescraft and world politics. That's that right. Yeah. Which is an interesting, I mean, it's not something you could probably get at any school. Yeah, that's right. No, it's a, it's a clear, um, uh, they definitely see uh, the idea of international relations mm -hmm. and, and geopolitics as um, we need people of character in these fields. This is the direction mm -hmm. of a nation. This is the direction of the world. And we need people with character who really feel called to these, mm -hmm. to these areas. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's exciting. Well, so to get to the book a little bit. <clears throat> um, so now I'm not yet making sense of single life in the 21st century. Um, the basic you know, premise is that you're exploring um, how <coughs> women can navigate a new extended period of singleness, basically. Yeah. Um, what inspired you to write this book? I mean, what, what was kind of the, the, is it something you thought about for a while and then finally did? Or did you get excited about it you yeah. know, in, in the early 2000s? Or? Sure. Well, I actually, no, I had not been thinking of it. Uh -huh. But it all, it, it, it's rooted very much in my own experience that uh -huh. I thought I'd be graduating from college and soon after getting married. And when that didn't come along, um, a lot of questions were raised in my mind by my late 20s. What's, you know, what is my path through life? This isn't, my, this the reality is not matching my expectations. So what do I do about that? And how do I reconcile these two things in my mind? And as I looked around, I could see a lot of other young women, my peers, wrestling with that as well. And sometimes that led to not very productive use of time, either spinning wheels in a sort of a dead-end job or um, dating guys that weren't the greatest yeah, or just yeah. really questioning and um, often getting very anxious about their, where they were in life. And that concerned me. I thought, you know, this isn't the way it's supposed to be. We yeah. shouldn't be have it struggling this much to make sense of where we are in life. And so one day I was actually um, coming back from visiting my family and friends in Wheaton, Illinois, and flying from Chicago back to Washington, D.C. And I always joke about the fact that my friends at the time uh, in, in Wheaton area had, were married and had 2.5 kids. <laughs> now they're up to like 3.5. But yeah. um, <laughs> um, at the time, they were about th at that level. And so it was always kind of a culture clash because I would come back to my friends mm -hmm. in D.C. who were roughly my age, and at that time still a lot of them not married or maybe yeah. just approaching marriage. Yeah. Um, so much different cultural scene. And, and that contrast always made observations more poignant. So I'm flying back from Chicago to Washington and just start getting these ideas and, and writing them down and, and putting the line at the top now and not yet, um, which by the way is the title of the book to cut to the chase. But yeah. the, um, in, in that, I, I was writing down ideas to basically say, yeah, we may not have reached what we're hoping for, mm -hmm. But that doesn't mean we should throw away this unexpected in between. This is valuable time. We need to cherish it. We need to make the most of it, even as we hope for something in the future. Yeah. And so that set of ideas came um, on that plane ride. I didn't presume that I would write a book on it. I thought maybe that would be some talks that I gave to women's groups or um, at a Sunday school or something like that. Yeah. And it came about shortly after that that uh, through a series of circumstances I was approached by a book agent, actually somebody I'd gone to Wheaton College with, and he asked if he could promote it to some publishers and one of them took it, Multnomah, yeah. and that I, I wrote the book during the course of 2006 as I was finishing my master's, yeah. crazy time, <laughs> don't recommend it, um, <laughs> and then it came out in 2007. Yeah, You start the book with some interesting statistics about just the situation as it is right yeah. now. Could you yeah. Do you overview those? Yeah. Well, one of the things that I wanted to do here was to make clear this is not all in our heads. <laughs> yeah. This is a really, um, this is dramatically affected by some changing cultural issues. So it's very important to kind of paint that cultural landscape and give these statistics. When, when, our, when my mother was my age, the average age of marriage was about 21. Now it's more like 26. It's getting towards 26. And that's a pretty dramatic shift yeah. in a generation that we're not really talking about. And when I, I, I interviewed quite a few women to make sure this wasn't just my little viewpoint on the world, none of them had been instructed, whether in a church or in a different kind of setting, as to how do you live most of your 20s single. Nobody had prepared them with that sort of expectation, what guidance you might need, hmm. those kind of things. 
And as a result, there was this, this was, you know, sort of hit everybody in the face, like, wow, I, I, I was sort of expecting to be getting married here, and now I'm kind of on the yeah. eve of my 30th birthday. Yeah. And that, um, the, the other statistics that's interesting is that a third of women are now are not married by age 30. Wow. So that's a, a significant aspect of, of life entering our 30s, yeah. significant aspect in the way we form families yeah. and, you know, start having children and all that. And, yeah. and you read a lot about the repercussions of that today. And I think you said the expectation, you know, high school girls that are interviewed, most of them want to get married, you yeah. know, think they'll get married. So exactly. So that, that lack right. of, you know, maybe knowledge of what, yep. what will it actually be like yep. at 25 or 30. Yep. That's actually a very important statistic to raise. Nine out of ten high school seniors say, senior girls, that is, say that marriage and motherhood is important to their future happiness. And that's been roughly the same for about 25 years. So you, you see this extremely high level of desiring marriage and motherhood, and yet a delay of when that's starting. And we're not talking about yeah. that conflict time. Yeah. Um, just a bit about that research you did. Who were these women you interviewed? What, you know, how did you decide to do these yeah. interviews? What was the format yeah. for the research for the book? So I did two types of interviews. Um, one, or two types of research. One was an online survey that uh, 650 women filled out. This was in no way a controlled group. It was just a random uh, smattering of opinion, but it was 650 women, all of whom were professing Christians, mm -hmm. and who basically gave their perspectives on a series of multiple choice questions that I, I, I posed to them. And then the other set, was, which was where I got much more the, the meat and the weight of the arguments that I present in the book, or the evidence that I present in the book, these were women who had been single something like a decade or more since college, and who were professing Christians from their 20s to their early 40s, their, I'm sorry, late 20s to early 40s, and who seemed to be, to some degree, content and to be making purposeful use of their time. Um, I, I either interviewed individually or in focus group 50 women who fit that criteria. And that was, what I was looking for there was back to the model of what I was trying to say in the title. Women who could give some history and um, clues as to what it is to have a heart poised between now and not yet. Hopes for the future, hopes for marriage, and yet purpose and contentment now. And I wanted some people that could give um, their testimony to that. Yeah. How have you seen, I mean, I don't know if this has been something you've come across a lot, but how has this conversation changed in the context of people of faith and outside of faith? Because the statistics are the same in both. Yeah. But as you've you know, spoken or interacted with single women, how does that affect yeah. the conversation or the questions? Well, um, I guess one thing that's interesting, I was treating the subject mostly for young Christian women who have generally grown up in churches who are teaching a high view of marriage, which is wonderful. The church has been a, rightly a safe haven for marriage in years past, in these last few decades. Um, and that cultivated them in them, in these young women, a desire to be married and to have children. And so there's sort of this added dimension of the idea that that's a right and good thing to have and when it doesn't come along, it gets wrapped up in questions of faith and God's goodness and where's my life going, all this. So in, in one sense, that's, I think, what yeah. that dimension of faith brings to the question is, is some added, um, really some added questions that we bring to this issue. Yeah. Um, well, most of the book is probably, you, you spend, um, you know, with questions and, and advice for women in this period, but just to kind of step out a little bit, why do you think this is the case, that this age has continued to, um, you know, from 21 to 26, and that women are spending more time single in their yeah. 20s? What, what is, you know, as an overview, yeah. what's an explanation yeah. for this shift? We have had some really dramatic cultural changes in the last generation. You have um, the, the cultural revolution, the feminist movement, um, the sexual revolution. These are dynamic <laughs> issues in society, and they have changed many, many things. Um, it changes the way that men and women interact. 
it changes what used to be a fairly clearly marked path towards marriage. There was a pretty clear romantic path towards marriage in generations past. And now with the hookup culture, with casual sex, that's completely up for grabs. And we've really sort of evolved into what I call a barter culture. And uh, it's pretty much up to an individual woman and an individual man what the standards of their relationship are going to be. Hopefully, there's a sphere of influence around them that will help them uphold good standards for that. Not everybody has that. Yeah. Um, even within the church, not everybody has that. So there's um, definitely issues with that. Women are getting a lot more education than we did 30 or 40 years ago. That has changed our outlook. And I think there's some need to recalibrate our relationships as men and women in this post-feminist, post-sexual revolution to be able to know even mm -hmm. how to um, navigate relationships mm -hmm. with each other and not just look at each other through the fog of cultural assumptions that are out there. Yeah. We, our, our culture definitely um, encourages us to see one another through some stereotypes that are out there. Oh, she's, she's 30 and has a good yeah. title at her job, so she must be a career woman and not interested in marriage or motherhood. Well, I'll scratch the surface, and these women that I talked to, that was not the case at all. Um, they had definitely different viewpoints and, and were eager to consider marriage. So, and vice versa, there's all kinds of ways that we as women are um, tempted through our cultural assumptions to look at men and make assumptions about where they are in life or where they're going in life. So we're going we're gonna to have to do some defogging yeah. and to look at each other as individuals um, made in the image of Christ to, to be able to have, I think, yeah. solid, good, meaningful relationships. Yeah. What were some um, expectations you walked into the book writing process with that maybe were changed or things in, in the research that surprised you? I mean, you're, you're mm -hmm. writing about something that's in a lot of ways a personal experience, but what did you find that surprised you about, about this extended period of singleness? That's a really good question. I think that, um, I guess I was, it helped me even to mm -hmm. take down some of my assumptions about um, men and women in this mm -hmm. period. One of the things that I tried to do was to interview men as well as women because I didn't want this to be just a she says book and so I interviewed about a dozen men, half of them roughly in their kind of 20, 21 to 25, the other half uh, over 30 to early 40s. And this will get around to autopilot being yeah. the answer to your question but basically what um, I saw on the part of the younger men was that there was sort of an assumption that they had been through college and sort of coming along life on autopilot and there was a bit of an assumption that marriage would be part of that and there were just a few of them at that age group who were beginning to think about taking deliberate steps to actually pursue marriage. The, the over 30 men on the other hand definitely saw the need for that and, and looked back with a little bit of regret that they had let some of their 20s go by on autopilot. Now, autopilot was not just a symptom of the men that I talked with. It was certainly of the women as well. And so there's, I think, what kind of became clear to me about that whole aspect in the section in the book that I talk about this autopilot phenomenon right. is that all of us, from kindergarten to college graduation and sometimes even master's degree, there's just this momentum that propels us forward year to year and you yeah. kind of get us into the assumption that life's other big milestones are going to arrive like that. Well they don't. It takes a lot more volition once you leave college to make those next steps and to be deliberate about that. And that includes being deliberate about relationships of any sort. Yeah. Um, whether you're going to keep in touch with the people that you're sitting with now. Um, how you're going to relate to your family after that, that school time is done. Uh, everything requires a little more deliberation and reflection. And that yeah. autopilot inertia can definitely overtake us. Yeah. I found that to be true. <laughs> um, well, we're going to open it up to questions from the audience in just one moment. But just to ask you a final question, bringing the policy work in the book together, um, how has this social or the social shift 
um, affected, you know, maybe a general understanding of marriage, or how do you see the, the work that you're doing at Heritage intersecting with the research that you did with the book? Yeah, two ways. Yeah. The first is that there are all kinds of issues right now with mm -hmm. delayed marriage, mm -hmm. um, increased cohabitation, yeah. increases in unwed childbearing. We are going to probably this year hit 40% of children being born outside of marriage mm -hmm. overall. 70% has been hit in um, the black community. 70% of children being born to an unwed mother. That's staggering. Mm -hmm. um, so there are all kinds of issues associated with our difficulties in uh, entering and maintaining stable marriage relationships. Huge public policy questions attached to that. The second point mm -hmm. is that I, in doing the book, which was much more hard on the sleeve than day job public policy work. Okay. It was an, a very good reminder to me that in every public policy question we undertake, there is a human life story behind it. And it's important to keep those two connected mm -hmm. and to remember that we're, we're talking about human beings, human um, aspirations and hopes for the future. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's that has to be bound up in the way that we approach public policy issues yeah. today. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. All right, questions from the audience. Yes. Uh, real briefly, you, you talked a lot about how religious faith helps a civil society. Uh, where do you fall on the spectrum of Christianity? You're asking about my which denomination, yeah, which yeah. Okay. creed, well, which yeah. catechism, excuse me. Sure, sure. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm definitely uh, in the Reformed theological tradition and uh, worship at a Presbyterian church in America in Washington, D.C. Hi, thank you for being here. Do you think that there's a certain age that some women just kind of give up all hopes of marriage? And if so, what would that age be? Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I actually don't think there is. Um, I think it's, um, I think actually most women hold on to hopes for marriage for quite a long time. I'm, I, you know, a lot of these women that I'm talking to are in their early 40s and certainly um, still looking forward to marriage. The temptation, I think, is to not um, be uh, upset and bitter about that. And I think that temptation increases as, I, as time goes on. On the other hand, I've seen some examples of really, um, really good um, perspectives on and understanding the variety of ways that relationships enrich our lives even if we're not married, and the, mm -hmm. the variety of ways that we can find uh, very satisfying and fulfilling uh, callings. And that basically, we, we didn't quite talk about that, but what the book really boils down to is that having a sense of our callings is what will help us find purpose and contentment and direction mm -hmm. when life gets confusing in any chapter, but particularly in singleness. And so that's, that's the meat of it. And I think uh, women who have a good sense of their callings in life um, are, are better able to navigate that with hope and determination. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you for coming. I'm curious, you, it sounds like you had a lot of great um, experiences in your college years and, and just afterwards with uh, internships and foreign travels. Mm -hmm. Uh, how do you, I mean, we're all college students, how do you go about finding the right internship and uh, after you, how do you find them, how do you uh, choose them, how do you fund them, and uh, make the decision to either take time off school or to go abroad or to not take a, a job right away? How do you uh, go through that process? Yeah. Well, um, I guess I would say two things. One is kind of big picture and one will be micro, very specific to your answer. I think. Um, what I'm, call, what I'm referring to as callings is um, an inventory of our relationships, responsibilities, gifts, and opportunities. And I kind of use those four categories. And I think the sooner that you get in the habit of taking that inventory in your life, 
to discern where God is directing you, um, the better prepared you will be to be able to make choices about the specific opportunities that are available to you. Because there's going to be half a dozen things you'd love to take off a semester and do. How are you going to choose between those? If, you, if you're in the habit of evaluating, these are my gifts, these are my responsibilities, these are the relationships that I need to be committed to, these are my opportunities, it helps you narrow down your options. Now, specifically answering what you've got there, um, I'll, I'll advertise a great internship at the Heritage Foundation. <laughs> it's highly selective and you need to apply early to get in there, but um, it's a great one. And there are, um, they're just such a variety that I think it, it serves you well to acquaint yourself with the variety of them and let your interests be the meter of how to engage those or not. Um, and then try to talk to somebody who has gone through the internship um, and hear the ins and the outs, the, uh, the good, bad, and the otherwise about their experience. Thanks for coming out. Um, you've mentioned that there's a good well, probably like 60% chance that probably the women in this room will be married by the time they're 30, yeah. but you know, it leaves a 30% chance that they won't be. So as you talk about not being on autopilot and being deliberate and intentional um, with our choices, yeah. knowing that there's a 30% chance that um, we may be single for a long time, um, how should we go about like, choosing things like grad schools yeah. or, or things that might require a huge investment of yeah. our time Supposing that there's a good chance we could be mothers or you know mm -hmm. married soon, um, but also with the be mindful that it may not happen. I guess there's just a lot of choices women have to make, and I wondered what you had as far as advice. On that. Yes, very good question. A couple of things. Again, um, I would point back to well, let, let me say this first. Don't get into gambling on your odds of marriage in the next year. <laughs> that's a habit that's easy to get into. And don't try to make your decisions on that. Um, get in the habit of making your decisions on the basis of this inventory I'm talking about. And the, the, the options that are there in front of you it, have got to be evaluated with that inventory in mind your callings, your, your gifts, your opportunities, your relationships, your responsibilities. Mm -hmm. And being able to look at whatever options present themselves <laughs> through that grid is going to, I think, present some winners and some also rands. And then, once you've made a selection about the next step in life that you're going to take, keep balance. Don't, if you go to law school, <laughs> don't uh, absorb yourself you know, 24 seven in your studies. Keep, maintain balance, maintain relationships, mm -hmm. be in a church community, make sure you have diverse relationships and ex experiences. And, and that I think is the most important thing to um, keeping your schedule poised to now and not yet, is making sure you're, you don't bury yourself in your current life season. Mm -hmm. Um, you mentioned having interviewed some men who said that um, they were either thinking about taking deliberate steps towards marriage or had kind of wished they already had. And I was just interested to know um, what kind of steps they were thinking about. Um, I think it's sort of something we're not um, very familiar with. Yeah. And um, we tend to think marriage and the right person just yeah. sort of happen. And so um, yeah. what, are, what are those deliberate steps? Yeah. So in the book, I, um, I put down to paper one of these conversations that I had with a guy who was probably 23 or 24. And the conversation we were actually having with a few of his peers. And he described it that he would go out with girls just to have fun and just to hang out. And then every so often he would realize, oh, I'm not really doing this to move any closer to marriage. I'm just doing it to kind of fill my time. And that's what I mean about the difference. And, and then he would catch himself and think, oh, I, I actually probably should be thinking about finding somebody I might like to marry. And that would make his choices slightly different and the way he spent his time slightly different. So those are the kinds of um, uh, deliberate choices I'm talking about. And, um, and I, the same goes for women. You know, the, the, the people you choose to associate with, the people you invest time in, making sure that it's, it's pointing in that direction 
at the appropriate seasons of life. Hi, thanks for coming. Yeah. Um, my name is Elizabeth and I'm a senior in the PP&E program. And um, I'm really interested in education policy, so it's a little bit different. Okay. But um, you mentioned that um, choices are the best way to change the um, education system yeah. right now. And I was wondering if, um, if also in that, if there's like a curriculum or a pedagogy change that would, yeah. that would help the, the current system. Um, seeing as choices and stuff, that probably won't, it can't, it's not an immediate solution. Yeah. It takes a while to like filter yeah. through all that, but curriculum could happen um, more quickly. That's yeah. What yeah. Well, um, I think your question is very good, and I just read an interesting article by Russ Whitehurst at Brookings Institution on curriculum reform specifically that you might be interested in. But um, zooming out to the larger application of that, I think we have two very interesting uh, situations that we can parallel and contrast, Washington, D.C. and the state of Florida. In Washington, D.C., we have this exact experiment going on where you have Michelle Rhee, who is an aggressive chancellor who's trying to make changes in the public school system that is so um, off course. And then you have this DC Opportunity Scholarship Program. And she is saying, keep the scholarship program alive, because I don't have a place, Congress, by the way, is trying to end this program. And I don't have a place to serve these kids. The schools that I'm working on, the DC public schools, are not changing fast enough, even if she tries to make those curriculum changes. Now, if you go to the state of Florida, under Governor Jeb Bush, former governor, they enacted a whole range of systemic changes that included ending social promotion and grading schools on an A through F scale and making sure teachers were getting rewarded for their good work in the classroom and allowing choice when schools repeatedly failed. Well, they have had dramatic results. Um, schools have improved when they get down to being graded a D or an F. Uh, they remarkably find ways to get better and not lose students. Um, we have seen Hispanic and minority and low income students in the state of Florida outperform average students in 15 other states. So you have dramatic re results coming from systemic reforms. So I absolutely agree with you that there should be an integrated set of reforms that must include choice to be as effective as we've seen in Florida. Thanks, Jennifer, for your talk. I really enjoyed it. Um, I've got a friend who works at the Institute for American Values, yes. um, David Lapp, and he actually graduated from, from King's here. And, and he, he had wrote a great a, Wall Street Journal. Well, that's, that's what I was just about today. to mention. Just Congratulations yesterday. to him. <laughs> yeah, it was a really very good article just on explaining why he decided to get married okay. at 21. Um, and uh, I just thought I remember one uh, comment that he made in that article, and I hope you could um, just uh, give some comments on it, was where he said, that there seems to be some sort of false dichotomy between people, uh, when they look at marriage, when they think of it uh, as a sort of dichotomy between one's personal fulfillment now, or individual fulfillment now while single, as opposed to when you get married where that all stops. Mm. There seems people seem to sometimes are sort of scared about marriage because they think that you know, individual fulfillment stops at that point when they, when they get married. So I just thought I'd like to hear your uh, comments on that. That's a great observation and question. Um, I do think that a lot of our quandaries about marriage today are bound up in views of individualism that confound us. Um, I think that we have a sense of, it would be more healthy for us, both as singles and entering into marriage, if we saw our individuality as needing relationships to be complete, that relationships are a fundamental part of who we are as individuals. And if we had a more unified vision of relationships and our individuality, rather than seeing those as distinct. Um, very specific to the issue you're raising, I think David did a great job of outlining the fact that we you continue to grow as a married person and you grow together and as, as an individual at, in a relationship in profound ways that you couldn't grow without that, even as a single person grows in, in ways that a married person couldn't. So there are, there are unique and different ways that we um, grow in different seasons of life, um, all of them rich, and we shouldn't 
stunt our growth by staving off marriage because we think it's going to stop our personal growth. I think we, we have some real things to work through there. Mm. So I'm glad he raised him. Hi, thank you for coming. Yeah. Um, I guess um, I was just wondering what your opinion was on the family. Um, I know a lot of people, when they think of starting a family, they think of, you know, okay, the little homemaker at home, raising yeah. the kids, and the dad's working. Um, but as you mentioned, with um, women being more educated, you know, going into the field, getting a career, the the view of the family, <clears throat> so to speak, is is shifting. It's not so much, it doesn't look like that so much anymore. It's you know, you have the mom, the dad, the 2.5 kids, and the nanny. So it's yeah. like, what, what's your um, what's your opinion of the family going to look like, I guess, in the future with with this education coming in and with um, just the change in society? What, what do you think the family is going to look like in years to come? Yeah. Well, um, can I answer that how I hope it looks? OK, let me answer <laughs> it that way. I hope that well-educated women, and they're, they're getting better educated by the year. There's just really great strides being made by young women. I hope that well-educated young women see family life as a management type of role. And the idea of a home economy uh, that we really haven't quite had since um, since a more uh, agricultural economy existed in America. I'm not suggesting we go back to that. I'm suggesting that there are ways to move forward into mm. 21st century versions of that. So women seeing themselves as their child's educational manager, which I, I think will look very different in our lifetimes. I think it will look like a hybrid approach to education that sometimes is in a four wall building, but often is not, and takes advantage of all kinds of other virtual and other associative learning opportunities. So uh, a mother is an educational manager, hopefully a parents as educational managers, and um, all kinds of skill sets in an information and technological economy are very useful at home. We were talking about the fact that I think it's very advantageous for women to get advanced degrees um, because they typically make them more versatile to fit around family life um, versus other things that really have you uh, burdened at the same time that your family is burdened. So there's some, I think there's some really incredible ways that we could center both mothers and fathers work more around the home and I, I have one particular family in mind where they kind of have a season in season out model between husband and wife where um, they have more responsibilities in the home or out of the home give and take but it's it's a very much uh, interesting model that I, I hope we'll see more experimentation with in the future um, and and to, to have that as a vision of empowerment uh, I that's my real hope mm -hmm. Hi, I have a question similar to that. Um, we've been talking a lot about how more and more young women are going out and getting advanced degrees and jobs. Um, and specifically for this school, we have a lot of Christian young women going out and getting advanced degrees and hopefully jobs. I know in my... <laughs> hopefully. <laughs> so what, what I'm getting at is that in my family, um, I know my mom gave up her degree to homeschool my brother and sister and I. And I know my sister is experiencing some conflict with that decision as well. And do you think this sort of a, almost a role reversal that's happening where the women are taking on careers and in some cases the men are raising the family, if that's going to be a problem in families, not only because it's causing Christian women to experience conflict in mm -hmm. a sort of a dual responsibility mm -hmm. and because for the men perhaps it's not exactly what they saw themselves doing right, right. in the beginning. A couple of thoughts on that. I think that there, there's a very interesting report from Brad Wilcox in the National Marriage Project that deals with some of this statistically and, and, and polls men as to how they feel about it. And he raises some concerns about um, in this recession, uh, 
part particularly hitting men hard, some of the concerns about that in marital friction and so on. So that's an interesting read to get deeper into the actual facts about it. The I don't think we're approaching role reversal. I, I mean, I don't think empirically we are, and I wouldn't advocate that um, as normative. Um, I, I would more try to bring this whole conversation back to the subject of callings and understanding our gifts as individuals, um, men and women, and how we are to fulfill those in any given season of life. And this is why I think it's so important to put relationships responsibilities and opportunities in there and gifts because those there's a there's two sides of the ledger there responsibilities and relationships and then opportunities and gifts on the other side and you've got to balance those and if if life has you being a wife and a mother there are there's some exchanges that have to happen there um, some balancing that has to go on the choices we make in life mean we don't choose some other things. And that is part of what we've got to reconcile with uh, and, and choose wisely based on the way God has created us. Well, there's so much more I'm sure we would love to ask Jennifer, but we're going to have to end there. Um, join me in thanking her so much for being with us today. <laughs> And just so you guys know, next week our um, visitors on Thursday, we actually have Andy Mills, our own interim president, and then on Friday we have Bill Edgar. So please join us next Thursday and Friday for our visitors. Thanks again. Have a good afternoon.